Welcome everyone to our DC Advocacy Day issue briefing. Thanks for joining us live tonight. I'm going to put into the chat a link, a little interactive activity here. This is a link to look up what is your ward? What ward of DC do you live in? Or what ward is the organization that's located in DC of which you're a participant? In what ward is that located? So go ahead and click on that link. Um, and if you could put into the chat to everyone, if you're able to put in the chat to everyone or just to host and panelists, whichever is most available to you, of what ward that you're located in, just to see uh, a showing of what our spread is on the webinar tonight. And while we do that, I'm gonna make full screen here. So welcome everyone. My name is Rachel Feinstein. I'm the JCRC's Director of DC Government and Community Relations. And thanks for joining us again tonight for our webinar on our DC Advocacy Day issues, talking points, what to expect on Wednesday. And for those listening to this recording later, please feel free to reach out to me at any point with any questions that you may have. So with that, uh, just some webinar logistics. I think everyone is in participant muted mode. Um, I see Sarah Winkleman's hand is is raised. Uh, Sarah, are you able to message send me a message? Uh, okay. Can can everyone hear me? Everyone can hear and see me. Excellent. Okay. With that, uh, webinar logistics, please, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, enter those questions into the chat. The webinar, as I mentioned, is being recorded. A copy of the recording and presentation slides will be sent to all Advocacy Day registrants um, following this webinar. And everyone is going to receive a printed copy of the talking points that we sent around earlier today and some additional materials as well. So what to expect on April 10th? So we'll start the day with a breakfast briefing with Council Chairman Mendelson, and I strongly recommend that everyone plan to arrive at 7.45. We did say 8 a.m. start for the webinar, um, but I, the 8 a.m. start for the programming, 7.45 will give you enough time to enter the building, get settled, um, grab some breakfast. We will have catered breakfast from uh, Goldberg's Bagels, which is uh, the highest uh, kosher certification. And the breakfast briefing will be held at 1001 Pennsylvania Ave Northwest. And the it'll be on the ninth floor, you'll check in with the security desk. Um, and Sarah, I've seen a couple hands raised in the chat, but no one, putting anything in the chat with anything of concern. So uh, Sarah, if you're still on, if you could text me if there's some kind of problem with, or someone message me if there's some kind of problem with hearing me, if that's what the hands raised. Chat is disabled, okay, got it. Uh, in that case, if you have any questions, enter them into the Q&A. Oh, I see, I see all of the, the Q&A feature is here. Apologies for the logistical mix up here. Um, please enter into the Q&A which ward you're located in just to give us a sense of what the spread is here. So thank you and apologies for that um, discrepancy there in the participation manner. Uh, I don't think there's a way for me to enable the chat. I apologize. But uh, with, with that, now you get to just listen to me talk instead. But uh, any, anyway, breakfast briefing, check in with the security desk. If everyone who's on this call and who's received this call information is registered and your name will be with the security desk, if you think for some reason that you might not be on our list, please send me an email to get that corrected. And then we'll meet with council members and staff from 9.30 a.m. to about 12 p.m. If you have any, any scheduling issues, some of you have reached out with some, some scheduling limitations, 
please let me know immediately. Uh, but I think for the most part, everyone is available between that time period. And uh, most of the meetings end at 11, 11.30. There are several council hearings going on that day, um, several in the morning uh, and then more in the afternoon. So most of our meetings are so focused in the morning because of it's just a very busy council time with uh, with budget hearings and budget oversight. And I'll get more into that in a little bit. So council member meetings. So each advocacy day attendee will receive a folder of handouts and information. The your advocate folder will look like this, the blue folder on the right. And then there will be one folder for each council member and or their staff this white folder here that, that will be given to the leader of each group. And you'll receive an email tomorrow with your group, um, with who is in your group and who your group leader is, along with additional handouts and what your schedule will look like for that day as well. So just a few lobbying tips. Be sure at the beginning of each meeting to introduce yourself, thank the council member or staff for their time for the meeting, um, briefly describe your connection to JCRC or to the Jewish community, whether that is what ward do you live in, what ward do you, you work in. Be sure to keep introductions short, um, listen attentively. Sometimes as staff or a council member are talking, uh, if, if you're in sales you, you or you do lobbying or any kind of, of interpersonal work, you know that people can kind of tee up what is top of their mind with what their conversation, how their conversation flows. Um, if you don't know the answer to a question, it is perfectly fine and actually a good thing to say, I don't know, but let me follow up with you on that because it provides you with even more of a reason to follow up with that staff member or a council member and to connect us JCRC with that council member and further deepen that relationship. Um, also asking staff or the council member if there's any legislation in particular that they're working on that you can help speak in support of or, or speak against depending on, on the issue uh, to, to, to be an advocate working with them as well. And of course, thanking the legislator, the council member and the staff for meeting with you and for their support. Uh, be aware that this is, I know in Congress or and in any elected body, everyone always says, oh, this is a very tight budget year. We only have so much to work with. But in D.C., this really is a very tight budget year. A lot of the money that was dispersed to states and territories and, and D.C. included uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, that money is expiring. That cash flow is going away. So there's a significant gap in the budget right now. And uh, last week it was announced that several beloved programs were going to be significant, really significantly reduced or completely gutted. So for example, the pay equity fund, which pays preschool, private preschool teachers and daycare um, faculty uh, an additional wage to bring them up to being on par with public school um, workers, that program was completely eliminated. And I'll get more into that issue in a little bit and we'll go through our advocacy talking points and issue summary, but it's extremely tight budget year, especially for DC. And a, a lot of and, and being aware of that will uh, provide some context for what to maybe expect with some of these conversations and how difficult this year is, especially. So some lobbying dues, what to do. And also in case anyone is concerned with being considered a lobbyist or having to register to be a lobbyist in DC because of this advocacy day, fear not, you you are not, you're, you're participating in a lobby day as we'd call it. You're not, your, your primary job is not a lobbyist, at least for JCRC it isn't. So you are participating in this day as a affected resident of the area and and being an advocate, a citizen advocate on behalf of yourself or and or behalf of your organization that you work with. So be mindful of the time when I start a, a meeting with a council member or staff, I like to ask if anyone has a hard stop. Do they if this is a 30 minute meeting and you have some time between your next meeting, but they don't they have another meeting right afterwards be be aware of that and, and ask it's it's courteous. Uh, focus on one issue at a time, not all at once. I highly recommend once we go through the, the issue briefings, 
if there's one or two issues that really call to you in particular, pick one or two issues and really focus on those issues as what you speak to. Uh, make clear what the issue is and your position on it. The council member is supportive of the issue. Thank them. By and large, I think most of the council members are pretty supportive of restoring the pay equity fund. Um, council member Bonds has been, who's an at-large member, uh, has has voiced support, but has not come out as strongly as some of the others. And that might be the only council member whose meeting is actually still not 100% confirmed. But if we do confirm that, it would be great to uh, really hone in on that point with the pay equity fund and, and get that support. But otherwise, most pretty much all of the council members have been very supportive of restoring the pay equity fund. Of course, following up after the visit with a thank you email, um, general common courtesy. So lobbying don'ts. Uh, don't confront, pressure, or beg the council member or staff. Uh, this We're all people and keeping it conversational, but professional is key. Don't be argumentative. Uh, start, try to stay focused on the subject. Uh, sometimes if you're talking about a subject and it reminds your audience, the council member or staff of another issue, and they want to deviate a bit to that issue, maybe give it 30 seconds, but then try to find a way to bring the conversation back to what you were just discussing. And of course, since you will be in a group and talking potentially about more than one issue in your group, be sure to be to be courteous to others in your group and not talking over each other or interrupting. And, and, and once you are um, put into your groups, for your meetings on Wednesday. And, and again, I'll send out your groupings uh, tomorrow, um, tomorrow morning sometime. I uh, highly recommend that you, and I'll share the, your, the contact information of the groups so that you can connect ahead of time if, there, if you wanna make a plan of any kind with the flow of conversation or just connect ahead of time. Um, don't emphasize one issue over others. A lot of these issues complement themselves, complement each other rather, so finding a way in, in these conversations to how a lot of this comes back to, like we're, we're supporting a strong Jewish community. DC's Jewish community has grown significantly over the last 10 years. And like this is the issues that we're advocating on today help to support not just the DC Jewish community, but DC as a whole, bam. Uh, and also very important, don't be political. Uh, two council members are under potential recall right now, that's council members Nadeau and Allen of Ward 1 and Ward 6, respectively. Uh, don't bring up the recall in any offices or ask, hey, how's it going with the recall? Not, not great to remind them of that. And I, I think legally they can't talk about the policy, that the policy staff can't talk about election work. And uh, to, don't bring any of that up. Also, by and large, uh, all the council members are the Democratic Party, and regardless of your political persuasion, I think we can all agree that we want D.C. to be a great place to live and work, and that is the focus of our advocacy and keeping politics out of it. So priority issues and talking points, and I'm going to bring up a document here in a minute, the document that I sent around earlier today of uh, our Number one issue is reinstating the Early Childhood Educator Pay Equity Fund, which I'll refer to going forward as the Pay Equity Fund. Second, supporting funding for affordable housing, support security for nonprofits and faith-based organizations at risk of hate crimes, and combating anti-Semitism in DC. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing briefly and pull up this document. I'm also just going to check the Q&A just to make sure. Just make sure see everyone is good. Okay, excellent. Thank you, everyone, for entering your wards in the chat. Love to see it. And also, there is a really great question. What do we do if ceasefire now or any other anti-Israel issues come up? Great news. Uh, we've got talking points for you on that. So we will I'll tackle that when we get to that in our talking points. So with that, I'm going to share my screen again here. There we go. Okay. So first up, 
reinstating the Early Childhood Educator Pay Equity Fund. Uh, this was uh, fully funded by legislation passed in 2021, but the funds didn't actually be, de get dispersed until 2022, I believe, into 2020, 2022 to 23 school year. And the purpose of this fund was to pay a, a livable wage to childcare and preschool faculty and to really provide that ability to compete with public preschool wages. There are public preschools in DC now. Um, I don't believe there's public daycare. That is continues to be private, but the, the public preschools have a, a union and they're able to negotiate their salary and come from a stronger position than the private school workers and the pay equity fund uh, allows the it, it empowers the private preschools and daycare facilities to remain competitive for for good employees and also to incentivize um, teachers to pursue advanced education and the 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 fund that the, the fund pays the money to the schools and then the schools disperse the money to the teachers and the amount the teachers receive is based on a formula that's based on their level of education. So it's, it's very much based on education and potential learning. So, or not potential learning, I shouldn't say that. It's based on, on credentials, education credentials. And some teachers are receiving like a significant amount of money comparatively to their, their base wage. So a teacher could be receiving I, I've heard $18,000 per teacher per year in some cases, depending on education level. So that that is significant. And for and there are four Jewish preschools in D.C. that participate in the pay equity fund. And three of those four, it represents 25 percent of their budget. And it's, it's significant. And I've heard from the preschools, uh, which are um, Otis Israel, Washington Hebrew and Temple Sinai. And then also the the JCC downtown. Um, I've heard from the the first three of those listed that if if this program were cut, there would be a significant reduction in in teachers and in the ability to serve uh, young children, and it would be a huge blow to the DC Jewish community. I can't imagine living in a city without more than one Jewish preschool. It's just unfathomable. So we are advocating to restore the pay equity and fund in full. The issue with the budget, the uh, I believe the CFO of the city was adamant this year in the budget process. And the CFO, it's, it's, it's kind of like a representative of Congress within the city government in a way. And the CFO was adamant this year about replenishing a $250 million rainy day fund that the city has. Um, and there's there's different financial reasons for that, including the city's credit rating and making sure that the city is has a, has a is financially healthy. However, they wanted to re, the CFO wanted to replenish this this rainy day fund all in one year. So the, the, the mayor and her staff needed to find $250 million from from somewhere within the the city budget in what was already a tough budget year with in excess of 700 million dollars in uh, that there was a budget cap so several programs were cut the pay equity fund uh, i think a lot of us expected it to be reduced in funding but not completely eliminated so it was completely eliminated 64 million dollars and of that 64 million, 1.8 million goes to Jewish preschools. That covers, uh, so here are the talking points. So this document, which I sent earlier today, we have the issue summary followed by the talking points. And we have a shorter version of this document for the city council members, which includes just the issue and the call to action, but not the talking points, because we want the this that to be like a leave behind for this other document for you to leave with council members and staff and for their notes to be on what you say in, in instead of the, in lieu of the talking points, we want them to be taking notes and paying attention to you and how you relate to these different issues. So talking points for the pay equity fund, 
call to action, the ask is fully restore the $64 million pay equity fund and gets a little bit into some uh, statistics that you can use to cite. If this fund is not restored, Jewish preschools might be forced to shut down or dramatically downsize their preschool capacity. Um, preschools provide smaller classrooms for children with learning differences. Uh, then across the board, a disproportionate number of early childhood educators are women of color who will lose a significant source of income if this program is eliminated. Um, how can we have a vibrant downtown with people returning to work in their offices if there isn't enough child care or preschool coverage for, for children? How can people continue to live and work in the city if there aren't enough options? Um, and highly recommend uh, sharing any anecdotes or personal stories about the impact of Jewish preschools or any like specific preschool educators on your own life or in your in your child's life, whether you attended a, a Jewish preschool in D.C. or I personally, um, well, I attended a Jewish preschool in southern New Jersey, and I have really fond memories of preschool and of very strong good memories from when I was three years old because of Jewish preschool, like making challah every Friday afternoon, getting ready for Shabbat. So I think like sharing stories like that or just about like how special your the teachers are if you have a child in preschool, sharing anecdotes, personal stories can really make a huge impact. And then our second issue is uh, supporting funding for affordable housing. So again, another um, budget uh, issue in the FY25 budget, there is a, for, for the last few years, there's been a $100 million budget for the DC Housing Production Trust Fund, and that was cut down to $60 million, so a $40 million cut. And this would significantly reduce the city's ability to support affordable housing options, and, and many of the synagogues that that we work with in DC and interfaith partners as well do a lot of work on affordable housing policy, whether that's helping to manage um, housing, home, homeless housing shelters or different services, food aid. Um, I think the Housing Production Trust Fund mostly addresses funding um, new public housing or new affordable housing. Um, and the, I believe the, the Washington Interfaith Network and others who work in the affordable housing space, like their main ask right now this budget season is to replenish this fund. Again, we understand that cuts need to be made somewhere, but cutting $100 million down to 60, that's significant. Um, if they can restore all of that or some of it. Again, the, the big ask this year is pay equity fund. We need, we have to restore the pay equity fund. Um, but secondarily, affordable housing. And really for all of these issues, again, if affordable housing is not an issue that speaks to you personally, then, then don't focus on that issue. Focus on something else that you can speak passionately about, uh, resonates with you, and as you talk about it, will resonate likewise with the elected officials and their staff. So Again, I won't get too much into the details of these talking points because I think it's a smaller group that works on affordable housing in our in our group today. But um, I think you know, in the wake of the pandemic, many families are struggling to afford rent and food. Um, reducing this fund will just exacer exacerbate this growing problem. Again, sharing anecdotes, personal stories about any work that you do. Uh, not just with your synagogue, but any community organization that you work with. And then number three is supporting security for nonprofits and faith-based institutions, faith-based organizations at risk of hate crimes. So this is something, this is a, 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 a this would be a grant program that I think nearly every local jurisdiction in our area, except for DC, has already established. So the issue, Jews, Muslims, LGBTQIA+, Asian and Black institutions have faced unprecedented acts of hate in recent years. I think we all know there's been a significant increase in, in, in anti-Semitism motivated acts of hate, whether that's threats, vandalism, 
um, SWAT, swatting incidents. Um, there's a, been a significant increase in anti-Semitism uh, since the October 7th attack by Hamas on Israel. So we submitted a request to Mayor Bowser earlier this year asking for $500,000 in the 2025 budget to provide for nonprofits and faith-based institutions at risk of hate crimes with funds to pay for security officers. So there is a federal program that many are familiar with called the Nonprofit Security Grant Program. And that program does not cover expenses for security officers. It most tra more traditionally covers costs for making physical improvements to a building, like adding metal detectors or uh, bulletproof glass film, additional security cameras. There's actually some DC based um, grant funding already for organizations to install um, security cameras. So the, those kinds of improvements are already well covered, but there is not really a strong program in DC uh, or federally that covers the cost of security officers. We know that having a security officer or some kind of security presence of a person outside of a building can be a significant deterrent to an attack. Um, the, our request for this was not included in this year's budget. And understandably, it's a tough budget year where even existing programs, beloved programs are being cut in the tens of millions that they might not include our $500,000 budget request. But to, this year can be a good building block moment to, to pave the road towards uh, creating something like this in the next budget year. So it's still important to bring this up. Um, and I know some of the Jewish organizations or not just Jewish organizations, but uh, nonprofits at risk of hate crimes that are not faith-based, but they, they don't qualify for the federal grant program, but they would qualify for something like this, is this is extremely important to them. So the call to action for this issue is if funding is available this year to allocate $500,000 for nonprofits and faith-based institutions at risk of hate crimes to pay for security personnel. And then if budget constraints prove to be too difficult to overcome for this additional programming to include it in the next year's budget. So again, thinking of this being an especially tight budget year and our other two asks uh, of that that are being communicated on on Wednesday are budget related and asking for money to be restored. Um, but again, this is very important to also bring up because we as a community are facing significant increases in anti-Semitism and it's it's an, it's an election year. And again, the, the, this money, if we were able to successfully get something like this next year, it wouldn't be in place until the following fall. So fall 2025. Um, but again, we live in the nation's capital. We live in a, a, a special place that receives more attention than other areas and other jurisdictions have already put this program in place, so this kind of program in place for security officers, um, for nonprofits at risk of hate crimes. So again, review the talking points. And uh, if you want to share anything, if you're on the board of a synagogue and you feel comfortable sharing with the council member or staff the investments that your synagogue has or or organization doesn't need to be a synagogue. Um, the investments that your community center, museum, school, synagogue, the investments that you've already made in hiring additional security, and to show, look, like we we have these are urgent needs. We need security officers. We need more. We're working to cover this cost in our budget, but it's really difficult and. Other jurisdictions have recognized the need for helping the local community at, like, uh, uh, affected by this, by these incidents of hate and helping them to pay for it. And we're asking DC to do the same. So, and if anyone wants to talk through any talking points or anything further, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, 
And then our last issue, which is kind of a set of four issues, but all related under combating anti-Semitism in DC. Like I mentioned earlier, and I think this goes without saying, we've all seen this, I think, that anti-Semitic and in anti-Israeli incidents in DC have really escalated dramatically in number and severity since the Hamas terrorist attack on Israel on October 7th, such as a campaign urging people to boycott Jewish and Israeli owned restaurants and performers. There was a huge protest staged outside of the Modest Yahoo concert at 930 Club a few weeks ago. Um, Anti-Semitic graffiti. Um, someone sent me a picture of a someone had an Israeli flag on their balcony and they've always had this flag. They didn't just recently put it up. And there was graffiti on a, a, a like an electric utility box across the street from this person's apartment building. And on the electric utility box, someone wrote Zionist pig and then had an arrow pointing up to this person's window with the Israeli flag. So and, and it's been quickly taken down. And when it's been reported, that kind of um, graffiti. But there's just it seems like a never ending slew of anti-Semitic graffiti, anti-Israel, um, just explaining why certain things are problematic. And just in general, in D.C., if you if you make a request of 311 to remove graffiti or signage, um, it it does typically get taken down within 10 days of making the report. But again, making council members aware of this, um, if they aren't already, or just making them aware of the discomfort and fear this kind of graffiti can cause. Not just the Zionist graffiti example, but other things too. Uh, there's been sig a significant number of anti-Semitic incidents in DC public schools, most especially at Jackson Reed High School. I know we'll have a handful of Jackson Reed High School students meeting with council members on Wednesday morning, and I believe they'll be speaking with our education director, Sarah Winkleman, following this call to um, talk through those issues specifically and how it affects them. Um, and also there have been ceasefire resolution advocates who pretty regularly in their talking points and what they're saying, um, espousing anti-Semitic tropes, and they've taken to disrupting council meetings um, almost every day. I think like they've slowed down this tactic a bit, but they, uh, I haven't seen them disrupt any of the 15 hour budget hearings in the last week or two, but before that they were disrupting council meetings and um, being, dragged out for refusing to leave or someone ran at the the dais the, the, where the council members were sitting at one point. So very uh, contentious issue. So first call to action related to combating anti-Semitism in DC to publicly repudiate all acts of anti-Semitism as they come to your attention, your being council member and or staff. So when constituents contact a council member's office with concerns about anti-Semitic graffiti or something like an incident for them to, not that they're not taking it seriously, but to reiterate how detrimental, um, how harmful anti-Semitism can be, not just to the Jewish community, but I mean, I think for a long time, um, people have considered anti-Semitism and increasing acts of anti-Semitism to be almost the canary in the coal mine of indicating that we have a problem in society with talking about things that are difficult to talk about. So, uh, and one of the handouts that we include in the legislator and the council member packet and in the attendee packet, I believe, is how to talk civilly about the Israel Hamas war and anti-Semitism. And we'll send that that um, handout to you tomorrow as well. It's a really great resource. So call to action number two, uh, opposing boycotts of Jewish and Israeli owned businesses, restaurants and performers. So I have seen several posts, mostly on Instagram of, of people calling for a boycott of Sababa Restaurant, Tati Bakery, Shook, Little Sesame, Time Kitchen, Patango, 
and O Mama Grill in DC. Like there is actually a list. Um, and when people start making lists about Jewish businesses, not great things happen after that. Um, and we need to reiterate to council members that if they hear or, or see any of these kinds of, of boycott lists, or if they're talking, if they're active in their community with the businesses in their ward or across the city, and they interact with these different businesses to support them. And and when people call for a boycott or like there, there was graffiti on Tati, one of the Tati locations just last week, um, to to speak out for council members and staff to call it out as anti-Semitic to hold a a non-government entity and private individuals um, accountable for any perceived action that is not their own. Like it's it's holding people to a different standard that you wouldn't hold you that you would not expect any other um, ethnic or minority group to be held accountable for uh, for. Uh, another government's actions for any government's actions. So then call to action three, uh, do not support a ceasefire resolution. So for many months now, as I've mentioned, the council has received significant pressure to consider to, to take up a ceasefire resolution. The council has been, uh, especially Chairman Mendelssohn, has been very adamant that they do not want to take up a ceasefire resolution, um, despite the pressure they've received from protesters disrupting their meetings, protesters disrupting them at dinner or their um, constituent coffee hour. Um, the, the council has remained pretty firm in that they do not plan or want to introduce or vote on a ceasefire resolution. And We've we've made it. We've reiterated many multiple times to the council um, that they they must remain focused on local issues um, that they can have a real impact on. That a ceasefire resolution would be extremely divisive and harmful to members of our community. And we've seen really horrific and anti-Semitic outbursts at, at city council meetings across the country nationwide when ceasefire resolutions have been debated people pulling out practically elders of Zion talking points to make their argument. Um, the very, very disturbing and kind of old world feeling anti-Semitic tropes, but also just the the new modern day version of, of blood libel, of accusing. I won't get into it because I know hearing some of these, the accusations and rhetoric that people are using can be triggering for some. So I won't provide examples. I think we know what those are examples are, but if you need them, send me an email and I can I can send you some council videos if you like from elsewhere. But um I think if you're asked if you're asked by a council member or staff, what how do you feel about a ceasefire resolution? Um if if you I mean a our position and this Advocacy Day's position is we do not support the council considering a ceasefire resolution for the following reasons. The council must remain focused on local issues, be extremely divisive and harmful to the community, and their anti-Semitism almost always rears its head at these council meetings. And I know anecdotally from, I think, especially the Bay Area, they saw an increase in anti-Semitic incidents following a council meeting that brought up a ceasefire resolution. I don't have hard data on that yet, so I didn't include it here, but there was anecdotally an increase in anti-Semitic incidents in that one particular area um, of the country where they had a ceasefire resolution discussion. Um, I think you can, if, if you would like, if you feel comfortable, you can talk personally about how that like discussing a ceasefire resolution of any kind would make you feel. I, I've seen some of the language that's out there of what's being discussed. And I, I think, I don't think a single version mentions the slaughter of 1200 people on October 7th. I think it calls for the release of hostages, but it says we call for the release of hostages on both sides, which to me is problematic and um, a bit, 
uh, it's not portraying the accurate reality of the situation. Um, so, and, and really just any ceasefire resolution discussion is harmful, um, is our position. It's, again, it divides the community, the council, the, the, the US government, Israeli government, the UN uh, does not, what the opinion of the DC council it's not going to impact the outcome of this war or what happens with a ceasefire. Um, recently, uh, we had put together a letter that was signed by, I think, over a dozen rabbis in D.C. of many different denominations. And the letter started out with some of us personally do support a ceasefire. Some of us do not. But we all agree that the council should not take up a ceasefire resolution because of how harmful it will be to the community. So I hope that answered the question. Um, also, I'm gonna share in the chat an article. I think everyone will be able to see this, Back to Pay Equity Fund that Alan Korn helpfully shared earlier in the Q&A. Um, but anyway, with that, um, I am going to Turn, oh, there's another question in the Q&A about the harassment of the Israeli embassy and the protesters outside and just like the horribly disruptive situation and, and harassment that's been happening outside of the Israeli embassy and some incidents of assault. And unfortunately, the protesters, the anti-Israel protesters are, they're very they're very calculated in what they do and most of what they're doing outside of the Israeli embassy is legal. Um, and I've, I've checked with council member Pinto staff on this council member Pinto is the, um, the, the head of the DC council uh, committee on public safety and security. And they said there was a similar issue some years ago at the embassy of the People's Republic of China, where there was harassment, not anywhere close to the degree of what's happening at the Israeli embassy, but there was a, an issue with a woman and several people out there with bullhorns and yelling really horrible things at the embassy. And they were, the the city was unable to to stop it. Like, I think it's it still continues because there's, it's, First Amendment protected speech and what is the line between like bl blaring a, a, a rate, an air raid siren and calling that like yelling fire in a crowded theater and what's First Amendment protected speech. So it's a very uh, challenging situation. Council Member Fruman, who represents Ward 3 and has jurisdiction over the area in which the embassy is located, um, as is very aware of the situation. I know he's visited the area uh, a few times. Uh, he did a re an, an interview recently with The Forward, I believe, which could have done a little better, but they reported it on the, the issues happening there and, and Fruman spoke about it as well. So uh, it's a very complicated, challenging situation at the Israeli embassy. Um, and I would not get too deep into it. I would focus on, on when it comes to anti-Semitism in D.C., I think a lot of the people that are organizing around the embassy and protesting are not from D.C. or a lot of them are paid to be there because they're, they're there all day long and all night, too. Some of them, they work in shifts. So I would not focus on what's happening at the embassy if you are not yourself a resident of that area or an embassy employee or like if, you, if you're not like immediately immediate vicinity directly impacted um i would stick to talking about anti-semitism you can mention how upsetting what's happening at the embassy is to you especially if you faced incidents there um but i would try to focus on some of the issues at hand and things that the council can do something about. They can't do anything at this point about the protesters at the embassy. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing this document and go back to the uh, to our 
presentation here and uh, just get back to, there we go. So with that, are there, at this time, so we have about uh, 13 minutes left. If you wanna put into the Q&A, if you have any questions or comments or anything else that you'd like me to expand on during this webinar that would help our ad your advocacy day, because this isn't just our advocacy day, this is your advocacy day too, as the DC Jewish community. This is our first DC Jewish community advocacy day with the DC Council. We're very excited to be taking this step. Uh, I think we have about uh, maybe 50 people, a little over 50 people registered and confirmed. And um, it's it's going to be a great day. I, I think council member work, working with council members at the local level can be uh, exciting and fun because um, it, it moves a lot faster. I, I came from a federal lobbying background. So moving from federal to local, it moves a lot faster at the local level, and it actually very directly impacts you um, more immediately than federal. So let's see. Okay, the question, if we could share with you the letter that we mentioned sent by DC rabbis to the DC council. Yes, I'll share that with this group. I'll send it via email. And all of the council members have a copy of that letter already, but um, I hesitate to add more paper to the folder that we give to council members, but I'll definitely send it to our DC advocacy participants. Um, thank you for asking that question, Mark. We'll share that with the group so you see. Um, okay, question, how will the groups be put together? Will people from the same organization, same synagogue be in the same group? Will we have a JCRC staff member with us? Yes, so people from the same organization or same synagogue will be in the same group. Um, if you're in the, especially it's the, you'll, you'll be put into groups based on what ward you're located in. And I've looked up each individual to see like how you're affiliated. And I think many of you have indicated in your registration form, which synagogue or, or Jewish Day School or JCC or which organization that you're affiliated with. So uh, we will defer to putting you in a group with people from your synagogue so that you can go in to the, the meeting, speaking about issues that affect your synagogue. If you live, if you're, if you entered your home address and you live in a ward where we don't have a lot of coverage, I might reach out to you tomorrow and, and ask if you're comfortable joining like another wards group like your home your home address ward rather than your synagogue um but generally like you will be put in your whatever address you provided that's the ward in which you'll by default that's the meeting that you'll be in um but for if you're affiliated with a synagogue like i know some attendees who are coming are maybe they live in maryland but they come to a synagogue in DC and are affiliated with that synagogue in DC, you would definitely be in the group with your synagogue. Um, will there be a JC staff member with us? Yes, some of the groups will have a JCRC staff member as your group lead. Some might have a, a board member. Um, it, it will depend. Um, we have, I think we have 10 meetings set right now, maybe, maybe nine. So, um, but we're also meeting with the at-large council members and their staff. So we've got eight wards and four at-large council members. And uh, so there will be a little bit of overlap between like some of the, like the individual wards, depending on the timing, will join up to create one big group to meet with an at-large council member because an at-large council member represents the entire city. Um, another question, are there any statistics from organizations that promote affordable housing that can be cited in support of our pitch on issue two? That would be helpful. Yes, there is an organization. I was looking at their website earlier today, actually, to see if they'd put anything up related to the budget cuts. And shockingly, they haven't put anything up related to the budget cuts, but I can provide 
some additional statistics on affordable housing um, that I can share. I'll include that in the next email or the maybe not the one tomorrow with the, the groupings, but I can provide some additional affordable housing statistics for DC um, the, to, to bolster the uh, affordable housing talking points. Definitely. Thank you for that question, Peter. Uh, let's see. I just want to make sure I haven't missed any other questions. We've got just a few minutes left here. If you have any questions at all, please put them in the, the question and answer. And again, you can always email me uh, following this webinar um, if you think of anything later. Okay, well, the Q&A has died down a bit here. So I think uh, just to conclude again, uh, if you're coming, I hope everyone is coming to the breakfast. Everyone is accounted for. If you're not coming to the breakfast, please, please, please let me know. Um, if you're only doing one or the other, breakfast or the meetings or or, or anything, like if, you, if, if you're not doing both the breakfast and the meetings, please let me know if you haven't already. Um, but again, be sure to arrive at 7.45 a.m. at Crowell and Mooring's offices. So that's 1001 Pennsylvania Ave Northwest. You'll check in with security with your photo ID and um, you will check in there. You'll be on the registration list. They'll send you up to the ninth floor. You'll check in, you'll get a name badge. Um, you'll get a, at least one folder, the blue folder. And then following, and we'll have a the, the briefing with Chairman Mendelson, who will be speaking about the, the state of DC and the, the council's budget work and we'll be able to answer questions as well. Uh, Council member Brianne Nadeau is also attending the breakfast and there will be time at the beginning of the breakfast, like the first 15 minutes or so, um, well, 30 minutes if you arrive at 7.45 to grab food, to talk with other advocacy day participants. Um, and then we will walk from the Crowell and Boring office over to the Wilson building where the council is located, which is about a like a seven or eight minute walk. Um, it's not too bad. And you can always grab a um, uh, an Uber, Lyft, taxi, if you're unable to make that walk over. So with that, if I've forgotten anything, it will be in my next email. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. I hope this was helpful. And if you're watching this recording and not live, again, please do feel free to reach out to me and, um, and, and send me an email with questions or feel free to give me a call as well. And my number is in my email signature. So with that, I'm going to close out the meeting and end five minutes early. And thank you all for joining. And thank you for committing your time to joining us for DC Advocacy Day this year. So have a great evening and we'll see everyone bright and early Wednesday morning. Thank you.